we remember before God those whom we love and light a candle to symbolize the light of Christ which shines eternally and brings hope. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. Blessed are you, Lord God, lover of souls. You uphold us in life and sustain us in death. To you be glory and praise forever. For the darkness of this age is passing away, as Christ, the bright and morning star, brings to his saints the light of life. As you give light to those in darkness who walk in the shadow of death, so remember in your kingdom your faithful servants, that death may be for them the gate to life and to an ending fellowship with you, where with your saints you live and reign as one in the perfect union of love, now and forever. Amen. Thessalonians chapter 4, 
reading from verses 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men and women who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not receive those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Each one. 
proclaimed in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, beginning at the 24th verse. Glory to Jesus, Very truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Very truly I tell you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be astonished at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. This is the Gospel of Christ resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever believes in me shall never die. May I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Feast of the Commemoration of the Faithful Departed, or sometimes known as All Souls Day, is a feast day that is sometimes misunderstood by the outside world. They would criticize the church by saying you are worshiping the dead or you are living with the dead. We constantly are reminded by certain smells, certain words, and certain kind of things about those who have gone before us. It is not that we are conditioned by them, but we cannot rub their memories out of our, our database. It is a year ago, yesterday, that my mother-in-law passed away, and there is many a time that my wife and I will comment, wow, this is what mom would have been proud of, this is what mom would have enjoyed, this is her favorite food, etc., etc. So it's not as if we are conditioned by those who have passed on. But you and I know that we cannot be uh, uh, seen as making us if they're not part of us. The Thessalonian community lost a number of family members and were mesmerized or confused or anxious, as scripture say, about death. It must have been hurting so much that they wrote to Paul and said, what do we do? We are hurting. And Paul very meticulously reminded them of the hope that we have, not only of what Jesus preached, but what he modeled after you and me. He highlights for them both the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension, and then he reminds them of the second coming. And he reinforces that even though you are unable to see Jesus face to face, he continues to dwell in all that we are and all that we do and all that we perceive here on earth. And Paul tries very hard to find words to give them hope. And I know that when you are confronted by someone who is grieving yourself, 
you struggle to find the words, to cushion them, to support them and encourage them. The one thing that Paul didn't do, he didn't walk away. He listened, he tried to reflect back to them. But the important thing that Paul did, he pointed them back to the way of the cross. You and I, as we deal with the death of loved ones and the reflective on where are they, we are reminded that Jesus too went before them. But we are also reminded that Jesus has the authority and the power to overcome death. And then Paul goes further and speaks about the second coming. And again, the theologians who wrote the scriptures ran out of words in the same way as in the book of Revelation where Paul said, uh, uh, Patmos, the island of Patmos, uh, it's not Paul that wrote Revelation. There we go, a theologian, John of pa uh, uh, on Patmos. And he runs up and he said, it is no more suffering, no more pain, no more hardship. He uses opposites to try and say, this is what you will not go through. You will no longer suffer because there's no pain, no suffering, no hardship. The streets are laden with gold and honey, and you and I who's from Johannesburg will know that's what they say about us. We always got money in our pockets when we visit people outside of Joburg. Uh, that's the assumption that there is. And so even John wrote, uh, ran out of words to try and explain. And here Peter, uh, uh, Paul runs out of words to the Thessalonican community. And he said, don't fear the fact that you are not dead yet. And don't fear about the dead. Because at the second coming, Jesus will allow them to emerge again. And you will meet each other, and he says, somewhere up there. He said, in the sky. What he's really saying, you and I too will die one day. And we will again encounter other ones. And then you will get now the millenniums of the say, Father, so those who are married three times, what happens? You will not recognize him for the relationship of marriage because there's no need for marriage. But you will recognize them as being in relationship with you as fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. And for me, that gives me a sense of comfort that I will again meet all of my loved ones and be able to connect with them. And as we reflect on Paul's ability to use this language of ordinance, to speak on mystical experiences of death, resurrection, and also ascension and the second coming, you and I struggle to sometimes get our heads around it. But Jesus wants us to be at peace knowing that whatever we go through, he continues to be with us. Paul, by giving hope to the community of Thessalonica, is not saying it is not painful. He is not saying it is not hurting. It hurts when you lose a loved one. But he's saying, regardless of the pain, the suffering and the hurt, know that you and I have hope in Christ Jesus. When I spoke to one of the relatives who lost their loved one, they said, Father, I don't know how these individuals who don't believe in God is able to go through grief without having someone like Jesus Christ to lean on. Because Jesus gives us the companionship, the comfort, but also, as Paul says, the hope. There's also the experiences that you and I go through when someone passes on. And we wonder, and we want to enter into that mystical experience of talking about ghosts and all of that. I shared one Wednesday morning, I finished seminary on the Friday and went home for the last time before I got ordained 
to Port Elizabeth to be with my mom and dad. That week, my mom passed away before I got ordained. And I always say there's one person that must get the trophy for being the one who inspired me, nurtured me, and modeled out for me is my mother. I became angry with God. I was frustrated. I was hurting. A few days after her passing, she appeared to me in my sleep. And then when I saw her state, it gave me a sense of peace, that she's at peace. Some people will say, Ah, oh, Father, you were hallucinating. Others will say, You must probably dreamt of her. Whatever it might be for them, for me, it was real. It is only after that experience that I was able then to start grieving properly. I also know of a lady I ministered to in my first year coming out of seminary under the training of Advocate uh, Reverend Errol Engler. And this lady, every time I go and visit her because she was in ICU, she said, why are you wasting your time coming to me? I know where I'm going to. You don't have to worry about me. My last story for today, the first ever time I was called to the hospital in the middle of the night to do the ritual, what we call the last rites, or the prayers for the dying. This guy had internal bleeding and all sorts of stuff going on. I started praying the prayers that he's in the prayer book. And something told me to stop and to ask him, is there someone you want me to call? He said, thank you for asking. He gave me the person's name and the number. I phoned and this gentleman was willing to come out. I left them, went outside of the ward. They spent quite a few moments together. And when they, when they finished, this guy said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he left. I went back and uh, completed the prayers. And while busy with it, he passed away. It was a messy death. Blood was coming out from all parts of his body because of the internal bleeding. When we buried him or participated in the actual service, I actually broke down and couldn't speak. And thank God I was in training because the senior priest realized what's happening. And he then went, continued with the service, and only halfway through the service was able to then minister again and participate. I consulted the psychologist and she said, Whenever you are witness to someone passing away in such a horrific way, go and let them clean the body and go back and view the body in a clean state. So that the image that is left in your head is one that is clean and you are able to move further. The points I'm trying to make is that you and I, whether we are consciously aware or not, are affected by someone's passing. The commemoration of the faithful departed ceremony is to help you and I to come to terms with the passing in a relaxed manner, to remember them and to thank God for them. But I'm also saying that there's times that you and I need to consult the medical profession, like psychologists and psychiatrists, in order to speak through our grief. The church provides that facility through our angry care counselors. But it's important that you recognize the need of just journeying 
with someone in order to speak about it. It hurts, and you have to speak through it and work through it in order to be healed from that. The gentleman who came to make peace, that in the prayers that was read, it was said that sometimes we are unable to move forward because of the things that we have not said, should have said, or would like to have said to the person that has passed on. And we are unable to heal because of that. We serve a God who is a loving, forgiving God, who is able to come and journey with us and forgive us our sins. Have you ever thought maybe it is God who interjects that you shouldn't say what you wanted to say? And just and now, that quietness to happen in order that both you and the person who moved on to the New Jerusalem should part in that way. We are unable to make sense of everything around the process of death. Nobody's got the answers because you and I have not been there yet. The only one that is able to answer us is Jesus Christ himself. The giver and receiver of all forms of life. I pray that this act of worship may be soothing to your soul and a means of strength as we journey forward in our spiritual journeys here on earth. Amen. Amen. At this point in the service, we're going to ask that you make sure that you have a flower and we will come and put the flower on either side of the altar in one of the vases. You can either mention the person's name out loud or just pause and pray for those you want to remember during this act of worship. Please don't rush, take as much time as you need and while we are doing that we will remain seated as we sing together I come to the garden alone.
eternal God and Father, whose love is stronger than death. We rejoice that the dead and the living are in your keeping. As we remember with thanksgiving those who have gone before us in the way of Christ, we pray that we may be counted worthy to share with them the life of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us celebrate all who have lived and died in the service of our Lord. They shall grow not old. Age shall not weary them. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Take, 
ate, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. <coughs> the bread which we break is it not a sharing of the body of Christ.